Um, hello guys, um, in this video I'm going to be talking about volumetric analysis and mainly I'm going to be focusing on titrations. I just thought we just want to like introduce it with, with the idea of volumetric analysis. Now in volumetric analysis, what this involves is reacting two solutions together. One of them being a solution of known volume, usually known concentration as well, nearly always known concentration and volume. And we react this with another solution, another different solution. And that different solution usually has a, a known volume as well, but we, we often don't know the concentration. So what we're doing with this volumetric analysis is we're trying to find out some sort of unknown thing that we don't know about that second solution, using the known stuff about the first solution and the single known, sing, the few known things about the second solution. And so anyway, um, volumetric analysis as it relates to titrations, um, there's a special kind of titrations and there's a special kind of volumetric, sorry, there's a special kind of volumetric analysis uh, which we call acid-based titrations. Acid base titrations. And yeah, um, it'd be really good to explain this by actually demonstrating how we would do this. I might do that. Um, if you want me to do that, just let me know. Um, but yeah, in this video, I'll just be explaining how what goes on. So in acid-base titrations, what happened? Titrate? Did I? Acid-base titr? Acid-base titrations? Titr? Anyway, in acid-base titrations, what happens is we react an acid with a base, and when we react this acid with the base, um. What happens is a neutralization reaction. And so this is a volumetric sort of form of volumetric analysis because we're reacting two solutions. One is an acidic solution and one is a, a basic solution. And so and so through this, with the known 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 values or known properties of the either the acid or the base, we can find out unknown properties about either the acid or the base, depending on which one we, we know about. So When we're using, when we're doing acid-based titrations, what we usually do, the way we usually react these two substances together in a way that we can actually measure the, the reacting volume of the unknown, is we usually use a titration um, apparatus. Titration apparatus, I would probably use that as pure because there's more than one things involved in the reaction. But anyway, um, I will write this down here. So in the titration apparatus the various uh, equipment which we use we use a pipette and a pipette is basically a device which we use to measure out the volume of the known the known solution so maybe it would be if we had the acid we would have a known volume of acid and we would know the concentration as well most of the time and we'd have a device and you might have seen use this at school. We'd have a device, and this device would usually have a sort of thing here, which we could use to we basically like a uh, like a um what is it like? You know, like a if you have a a, a lighter, like, sort of like a lighter, except we're using it for. Uh, where we're spinning it and what happens is it, it it takes up liquid from a container which would be down here and this would be full of the solution whatever solution we are we're going to put in known the known volume and this solution goes into the uh, conical flask device so i don't think red is a suitable color i just change color so we'd have a conical flask here Just trying to get these edges right. So we'd have a conical flask here, and what what we measured in here, because this would usually have measurements, it'd be a what we call a graduated um, pipette, graduated in the sense that it has uh, measurements periodically or along its its structure. So what we do is we put this into here, so this would maybe fill up up here, and then 
we would get our base or yeah because I, as i said this was an acid we'd get our base it could be the other way around but in this case we get our base and we would put our base into a burette and the way we spell burette b i u r e t i believe burette and what the burette looks like is basically a glass cylinder which is similar to the pipette except the top is more open and we can put liquids in there and it's got a sort of tap device near the bottom uh, so if I draw a burette what it looks like is we have a sort of tap device down here and as you can see it's a sort of vertical tap slightly different from the taps we usually see I think the last time I saw this, it was sort of orange. Orange. But this part down here is glass, so. I have glass down here, but we have a tap device in the middle so that we can control the rate at which we allow the acid to flow. And so anyway, we pour the, we pour the base since the acid is the known volume here. This is the base. Oh no, this is the acid. Yeah, so this is the acid. This is the acid. So we put in the acid. Yeah. This is the base. So we allow the base to flow out into this conical flask. I'll just label this conical flask. Conical flask. I'll just leave this as a container and um, this would be a, a pipette and this isn't your kind of plastic pipette this is more of a, a glass type which we use for larger volumes than a usual plastic pipette would be able to carry at one time so it, this would be the base and we'd have measurements this would be graduated just like this is graduated we'd have measurements along here and the weird thing about these two devices is that rather than 30 being down here, 30, um, well, no, no, what I meant was rather than 30 being up here, because, you know, you fill it up like this. Actually, I think 30 is up here on this one, maybe. So 30 up here. But on this burette, because we're allowing it to flow outwards, downwards, rather than flowing in upwards, the way our measuring system works on the bureau is slightly different as you, than you'd usually expect. It starts at zero up here and it ends on a higher number, say like 50 or something. And this allows us to measure the volume which has been used from, from that point. It allows us to measure the volume used to neutralize the acid. And that's, that's why it would be inversed. And so what we do is we allow this to open and by twisting this, so if you imagine this sort of twist, as we twist this, the acid would start to, well, the base, the base would start to flow out and it would start to drip into the acid. Now, how would we know when the, acid, the base is completely neutralized the acid? How would we know? Well, the way that chemists have got have, have 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 solved this problem is by using something known as an indicator and you've probably come across indicators before uh, indicators are substances which change color when a certain pH is or pH levels are crossed so at first with the, this acid mixed with the indicator might be a certain color say yellow yellow And it might turn red after the experiment, after the base has, has, has neutralized it and and turned the solution slightly basic. Now, obviously, in the middle of this, it would turn orange. So when it turns orange, I know orange and yellow, but yeah, pretend it's orange. So when it says orange, when it turns orange, um, we would know that this has been neutralized. and. Well, this states when it has been neutralized that when the acid when the, or when the base neutralized the acid or acid neutralized by base but when it's reached a point where the substance has been neutralized we call this the end point and the reason why we call this the end point is it, you, if you imagine you're doing your titration thing with your hand like here 
and this is flowing down it's like din, 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 din. so this is flowing down and the reason why i'm calling it the end point is because once it reaches that point when it changes color you stop it so this process of sneaking down reducing in volume from up here stops we have to end it and so we call that the end point and that's the basically the end of the neutralization process as well so you could look you think you could think about it that way as well and so yeah now as i said as i said a, few, a, a couple of seconds ago about this whole um the, the concept of the the indicator the indicator obviously needs to indicate indicate to us that when the nutrient when the process when the reaction has has finished so that we can stop it when we so that we can end it and the properties which we would want to have for an, a suitable indicator is that it has one color when it's acidic and a different color when it's basic and so that those kind of properties would make a pretty decent indicator now when we do this sort of experiment some of the things which we can actually find out using calculations which um you've probably come across before but i'll explain how this relates to the titration part but using calculations we can then use that information to find out maybe the molar mass of a particular substance in solution we could find out the concentration we could find out um, the number of moles of a particular um, substance in the solution all these different sort of things we can find out by doing titration experiments one thing I sort of want to do is work out the pH of Coca-Cola using a titration. And I could just search on Google, but I think it would be fun to actually do it as an experiment. So if you would like me to do that, just let me know. Anyway, so the way uh, indicators work, um, actually, I'm not going to go into that in this video. I'll make a second video which explains how indicators work, uh, along with the other videos about the titration calculations and what i'll do here is just i'll just talk about the different indicators which we come across in as chemistry i've got them written down here because i really really hate the spellings of these I, I find them tricky to do so i'll just write them out and then i'll explain like what how 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 we this this stuff is useful so the first indicator we have is methyl orange so methyl orange and you can often just go and find this stuff in some sort of book or on the internet methyl orange and bromo bromo this is why i just want this is why i want to write it out it's really i, I don't really like the spellings but anyway bromothymol blue bromothymol blue and phenol Talin, phenol, talin. If you know how to say this stuff, please let me know how you actually say it. Cause I don't know how to pronounce these two. I I I I, I can pronounce this one, but these two, I uh, no. And so when when these are in acids. So let's first look at what happens when they're in acid. In acid. And in base. And the reason why these two are important is because if it's a certain color in acid, we will know that if we add this to a solution, that solution is acidic. And if we add it to it and it turns a color which we can associate if we're looking at the data that that color is a base, that that color indicates the presence of a base, we know that that, that solution is basic. And I don't think you have to remember this stuff, but it, it's useful to know. So methyl orange, the color of methyl orange in acid is red. Oh, oh good moment when I try and write red and my thing is gray. Anyway, so methyl orange is red in acid and it's yellow yellow in a base so it's yellow when it's in a base and bromothymol blue is yellow in the acid 
So these two are obviously slightly different. And as you can see, it's called bromothermal blue. Guess what color is in the base? Yep, blue. It's blue in the base. And phenol phenolphthalein, phenolph. Okay, I'm just not gonna say that. Phenol. Okay. Um. I really like saying this. It feels weird. Anyway. How am I gonna represent this? Um. Well. Yeah, the reason why I'm saying that is because this is in an acid. This guess what color this is? Not available. Phenolphthalein is actually colorless, colorless in an acid. And in a base, um, this is pink. So you can imagine P, P, pink, pink. Yeah, blue, blue. And if we imagine the um, the transitional stages, so if we imagine what happens between these stages, I'm not going to actually do the colors for these, but I'll just, I'll just write down the, the colors as words. As in the endpoints, we're looking at the endpoints. This would turn from red to yellow. So obviously, the, the color between red and yellow is orange. So if it's turned from, if the solution has been neutralized, it's going to be orange at the end point. And this, if we mix yellow and blue, like let's say we mix the yellow and blue paint, we would obviously get green, green paint. So the end point for this particular one is green. It turns green between the transition from yellow to blue. And phenolphthalein, phen it, it basically turns from colorless to light pink. So when it just starts getting light pink, then we know it's at its end point. And that's only when it's going from acid to base. If it's going from base to acid, the way we know that it's um, neutralized, when it's fully neutralized, we know that it just it just went transparent. So it, when we're going in that direction, it turns colorless. And yeah, so that's the, those are the transitions involved. So in the next video, what I'm going to be doing is working through some calculations and i'll also be in another video explaining the concept of of indicators this is a sort of a2 idea a2 chemistry but i would like to explain it uh, for this right here so yeah um that's the end of this video um see you guys in the next video see ya